Ladies and gentlemen, I am the American Spy Fox. Welcome to the channel. In the last episode, we talked about Kristen Pfaff's last days in Seattle, according to her mother, Janet Pfaff, and her friend, Paul Erickson. In this video, we are going to recount Courtney Love and Eric Erlinson's account of what happened to Kristen and what transpired after her demise. First, I'd like to give a big shout out to Max Wallace, author of Love and Death, The Murder of Kurt Cobain. Did not know this before I had a phone conversation with Mr. Wallace, but he actually worked on the BBC film, or I'm sorry, the Nick Broomfield film, Kurt and Courtney behind the scenes. He was hired as a consultant. I was unaware of this prior to my conversation with him. Max is one of the very first investigative journalists to tackle the Cobain case. He is so knowledgeable about it. We talked about the different characters he met, you know, El Duce and Alan Wrench and just all these different connections to Courtney really opened my eyes, really helped me see the case in sort of a different light. And he will be appearing on the channel, if you have not heard, in January 2023. Max and I are going to be having a video conference call to talk about those behind the scenes investigations of his way back in the 90s. Also want to give a shout out to my aunt Nancy, who I ran into at the Walmart. I hadn't seen her in years. And when you live in small town America, where do you run into people you haven't seen in years? You run into them at the Walmart. Hell, half the reason we go shopping there is for family reunions, right? To my surprise, we, we chatted for a couple minutes and then we parted ways and she turned around and said, oh yeah, I'm into conspiracies. I saw your YouTube channel. Now you have to understand that with 7.5 to 8 billion people on the planet and only 50,000 subscribers, it's very rare for me to run into anyone who's ever seen my channel. And before we move on, I wasn't gonna do this, but I have to tell the funniest story of my childhood. My aunt was close to my mother, and like I said, she's only a few years older than me, maybe eight years older than me. She used to hang out with us a lot when I was a kid, and she was a huge Guns N' Roses fan, in love with Axl Rose. Of course, she went on to become a Nirvana fan and a Soundgarden fan and all that too. But at the end of the 80s, it was all about Axl Rose. Appetite for destruction. My Aunt Nancy dealt with growing up in a highly dysfunctional family the same way I did, with comedy. And I recall whenever a plane would fly overhead in our small town USA, my Aunt Nancy would put her arms in the air and she'd say, Axel's finally come to get me. Here I am, Axel. He's come to take me away. And as a little kid, I thought this was so funny watching her do this. And it also, you know, being uh, just a little kid growing up in this tiny little impoverished town, it made me realize that there's a whole world out there. And maybe someday I'll get to fly away like Axel Rose. And I always found that really funny as a kid. I always laughed about it because she was just so into Axl Rose and just your classic teased hair, bleach, dark roots, jean jacket, combat boots, ripped bleach jeans, just your classic 80s metal chick. That was my Aunt Nancy. Aside from me, I think she was the only person in our family that listened to good music. So everyone say, hi, Aunt Nancy. Okay, but seriously, introduction aside, let's get down to business. How do we know Courtney Love's account of Kristen Pfaff's last trip to Seattle? Well, Courtney's got a big mouth and she likes to talk a lot. Sometimes I think within her lies are ounces of truth. Sometimes she mixes stories together, as I believe is the case with what she told Tom Grant and David Frick of Rolling Stone. In October of 94, Tom Grant records Courtney Love through a phone conversation where she's talking about what happened to Kristen and how she found Kristen and all that. Then a couple months later in December of 1994, Courtney Love has an interview with world famous music journalist, David Frick. He wrote for Rolling Stone. I believe he may have even been the guy who wrote the last Kurt Cobain article where Kurt said, I've never been happier in my life. That one, I'm pretty sure that was a David Frick interview. If not, correct me in the comments. This is one of those videos that would have highly benefited from one of Tom Grant's phone recordings, and I, I wish I could talk him into it. I wish that he would share that conversation. To my knowledge, no one's ever heard it. Maybe I'm wrong, but 
we could highly benefit from everyone hearing Courtney Love describe this account of, you know, what happened to Kristen, how she says she found Eric and Kristen. Totally different from Janet and Paul's story, as you've already guessed. I think it would go a long way. It's one thing to hear Max Wallace or, or me or Richard Lee or whoever it is repeating the story and saying Courtney Love said these things. It'd be another to hear it in her own voice, in her own words. And then you're like, oh, wow, she is lying. Just like you're lying to yourself if you think you can continue to play Russian roulette with your personal information and no one out there is ever going to target you. You need a VPN, a virtual private network. Chances are if you're an 80s, 90s kid like me, you probably think it takes some kind of super genius computer nerd to hack into your information. It's not like that these days, guys. Any common criminal can do it. I decided to start protecting my information online. You guys know how I like to do things I read many different publications and then I compare the information publications like Wired Forbes magazine PC magazine they all told me NordVPN is the most secure fastest VPN on the market the way NordVPN works is it encrypts and shields your data reroutes it to any location in the world you choose to be from on any given day. Super easy to use, self-explanatory. You can be like me and just set it to connect automatically so you don't even have to think about it. It's like your little computer guardian angel just hanging out in the background. You don't even know it's there. Plus, you Netflix users get the double benefit of being able to watch more TV shows and more movies. You can check out what movies are on Netflix in Australia, what movies are on Netflix in the UK, Canada, wherever. So you get the most bang for your buck as a Netflix subscriber. If you're still thinking, nah, I'll just go ahead with my life playing Russian roulette with my banking information, let me tell you that your information has already been stolen, and I'll prove it right now. Have you ever been surfing the internet and an ad pops up, looking for ladies, and then it says your city, your state, or looking for car insurance, looking to buy a car? Have you ever asked yourself how that website knows where you are? That's because your IP address is wide open, people have scanned for it, and told this website where you are live and quite frankly those ads should be the least of your worries click on my affiliate link below you're going to get a super great deal compared to if you just go to the website on your own plus you're going to get a 30-day money-back guarantee meaning you could actually try out nordvpn for 29 days and if you decide that it's not working for you get your money back speaking of all that actually reminds me of an article i was reading once where courtney love was accused of paying computer hackers to mess with people who were talking bad about her on Twitter. So think about that. I digress, let's talk about the recorded phone conversation between Courtney Love and Tom Grant, October 1st, 1994, only four months after Kristen's death. Again, we do not know everything that was discussed in this phone conversation. I believe Max Wallace and Ian Halperin are the only ones that have ever listened to it. I have yet to have the privilege, if I ever will, but I'll tell you what Max Wallace and Ian Halperin talked about in their book. I'm warning you ahead of time that what Courtney had to tell Tom Grant is confusing and contradictory, which is like 90% of the dialogue that comes out of her mouth. On the tape, Courtney is talking about Kristen's drug use. First, Courtney tells Tom Grant that Kristen always used with Patty and that Kristen always put cocaine in her heroin. This is called a speedball. It's very, very dangerous. If you are gullible, naive, if you're thinking about going down that path, it is the most dangerous thing you could do. It's how River Phoenix died. This is how Lane Staley died. Andrew Wood, Shannon Hoon of Blind Melon, another person we should be talking about on the channel. Two of my friends from high school, Julie and Eric, both died when they mixed a lethal combination of heroin and cocaine. Don't do it. Again, you kids out there very very dangerous and if you do not get the mixture right it will kill you being easily influenced being gullible or being naive to something alone is not a weakness in fact i'd say that you 
are probably a good person who always tries to find the best in people and wants to make friends if you have these traits. Having these traits is not necessarily a bad thing, nor does it make you stupid or a bad person. It's the not knowing, not being aware that you are gullible or naive, easily influenced. That's a weakness. You have to be self-aware. So be self-aware, know yourself, and do not allow people like Courtney Love to influence you into doing things that you know you should not do. I know that I've went off on a bit of a tangent here, and I'm going to get right back to what I was talking about, but I just read an article about a rich kid in Hollywood whose family was friends with Courtney Love, and he died from an overdose. Now, Sharon Osbourne got PO'd at Courtney for offering her son Jack OxyContin when he was like, 15, 16 years old. She lived right next door to Ozzy Osbourne. It was during one of the seasons, the filming of The Osbourne Family. She offers Jack OxyContin. Sharon made it publicly known that she hated Courtney for this. Guess what this kid, he wasn't a famous kid, but he was a rich Hollywood kid and his family was friends with Courtney and he started hanging out with Courtney and guess what he OD'd on? He OD'd on OxyContin. Who do you think gave this kid the drugs that he OD'd on being friends with Courtney Love, hanging out with her? No matter how many people die due to this woman's influence, she continues to do the same thing, to exhibit the same behavior, and she has absolutely no guilt about it. She is a sociopath. Makes me so f angry. What is she even doing hanging around teenagers? She still employs teenagers to this day. I just recently had an 18-year-old girl contact me saying that she worked for Courtney when she was 17 and she couldn't stand her and all this other stuff. It's crazy that this woman, she, she's like some kind of creepy predator or something. She knows they're young and gullible and naive and she takes advantage of it and she does not care if any of them die along the way. Courtney Love was like, 30 in the 90s. Why is she so obsessed with kids? Why does she want to give kids drugs? What's the point? She can't deny it. This isn't slander. This isn't hearsay, conjecture, speculation, rumor. Sharon Osbourne outed her. Sharon Osbourne publicly stated Courtney Love offered OxyContin to my 15 year old son. Do not ever forget that Courtney Love was in Jeffrey Epstein's black book three times, three addresses, three phone numbers, and she employs children to this day. She tried to play it off like this was a revelation to her, like she was creeped out about it when she found out. Let me tell you something, men like Jeffrey Epstein with money and power and influence, they do not keep useless people in their contacts. Their contacts are full of people that they believe will become useful to them. They would not waste their time collecting celebrities' addresses and phone numbers for no good reason. Okay, let me calm down here. I apologize. Let's get back to what we were talking about. Courtney tells Tom Grant that Kristen always did speedballs, and when she did use, she would use with Patty Schimmel. So as we know at this point in history, in the 90s, Patty Schimmel is an addict as well. Patty is the one in Courtney Love's documentary that said she didn't want to go to Kurt's intervention that Courtney organized because she was using herself and she felt like a hypocrite. Then Courtney goes on to tell Tom that she never did any drugs with Kristen, that she never saw Kristen do any drugs, and that she was unaware that Kristen was even a drug addict until she heard about her going to detox. This is when Kurt Cobain was found and Kristen Pfaff decides I'm done with this and she checks herself into a detox. So Courtney Love is claiming that she was unaware of any kind of addiction that Kristen Pfaff had up until April of 1994. Just a quick look at pictures of Kristen before she entered whole and after she exited the hole, she came out looking a lot worse for the wear. Clearly, Courtney had to have known what was going on. Courtney's very familiar with that scene. She's very familiar with the signs. What an addict talks like, looks like, acts like. They toured 
together. They were in close proximity for long periods of time. She would have known. Now, if the Pfaff family became suspicious of Courtney, or if anyone they've spoken to is suspicious of Courtney, it's no one's fault but Courtney's. Because Courtney knows that Kristen's brother Jason knows that Courtney used to gift her cosmetic bags full of supposed clean needles and narcotics. If I'm Jason Pfaff and I hear that Courtney is denying she ever knew my sister had a problem and I, matter of fact, know that Courtney pushed her down that road, I'm going to become very suspicious of why Courtney is denying this. Why is she lying? No one can take away her baby because her bandmate has a problem. It's not as though she's admitting she has a problem. So why? Why are you lying? People being suspicious of Courtney Love over Kristen Pfaff's death is no one's fault but Courtney Love's fault. So Courtney Love goes from not knowing anything about her past to, oh well, Patty did finally tell me, to this. I want you to go ahead and listen to the YouTube channel SW Studios who read the entire Love and Death book. He has allowed me to use excerpts from his videos before. Thank you so much. Check out his channel if you want to hear that whole book. On the tape, Courtney is discussing Kristen's drug use. When Kristen did drugs for several months, she had always done cocaine with her heroin. This is according to Patty, Holes drummer. I never did drugs with Kristen. I didn't even know about the problem until she entered rehab. I knew that she'd done drugs a few times before she came to town. I knew that she partied. I don't think it's called partying. I think it's called totally self-destructive. I know what it is. It's fucking trying to kill yourself or numb yourself. Partying? Please. Patty did drugs with her, but she never did cocaine with heroin. She only did heroin. Courtney proceeds to talk about what she knows about the events on the night of Kristen's death. I have to be careful the way I word this here. I don't want any age restriction or video removal. So she went from, I didn't know anything about this, to Kristen Pfaff is trying to kill herself are we seeing a pattern here she is putting it in people's heads that this girl was self-destructive and once again just like kurt cobain Kristen was telling everyone around her including her hometown newspaper that she was so happy to be moving on with her life just like kurt said i'm really happy to be alive and i'm looking forward to the reaction from my fans on my next album it's unlike anything nirvana's ever done but yet courtney has a totally different story for her just like she did kurt cobain okay so let's move on and talk about what courtney told tom about the day that Kristen was found courtney proceeds to talk about what she knows about the events on the night of Kristen's death she reveals that eric had visited the apartment that night on his way to a date with drew barrymore and found Found Paul Erickson there. Kristen was already sleeping in the bathtub, she says, when Eric arrived. Eric's like, I heard her snoring, I heard her breathing. I thought if they were breathing, they were okay. Hold up. According to Paul Erickson's statement to the police, he's the one that found Kristen snoring in the bathroom that evening. He's the one that said, well, as long as she's snoring, she's breathing, she must be fine, so I'll just leave her be. Grant even probes Courtney about this. At this point in the conversation, Grant says, Eric's the one who heard her snoring? Yeah, it never gets attributed in the press, but I know exactly what happened that night. Courtney stands by her conviction. She doesn't change her mind and say, oh wait, well maybe it was Paul. She says, no, I know exactly what happened. The press has it wrong. I got the real story. Grant asks where Kristen's friend Paul Erickson was when Eric was listening at the door. He was in the apartment. It was a one-room apartment. Remember, according to Paul Erickson, he never even spoke to Eric Erlinson. He watched him from the U-Haul walk in the apartment complex and walk out without ever speaking to him. Now, according to Courtney and Eric, they are both inside this tiny little studio apartment, so it's not like they could have missed each other, and they're having a conversation about Kristen sleeping in the bathtub. Eric said, I'm gonna go on a date. If she's not out in 20 minutes, call my machine. I'll check it. And then Paul goes to sleep. So according to Courtney Love and Eric Erlinson, Eric says to Paul, if she's not out of the bathroom in 20 minutes, call my voicemail. I can check my voicemail. Remember, this is the 90s. Maybe he had a pager. He could probably call his home phone and listen to his voicemail from wherever he was. Here's how I react to that. Why would Eric be thinking anything bad would happen? 
Why would he say if she doesn't come out of the bathroom, call me in 20 minutes? Could it be that he knew she was high? Could it be that they had actually all used together and he wanted to make sure that his friend was okay? But he had to go because no one stands up Drew Barrymore, right? There is no other reason for him to say, if she doesn't come out of the bathroom, give me a call. Why would she not come out of the bathroom? Under normal circumstances, there's absolutely no reason she wouldn't come out of the bathroom. This makes me believe that Paul and Eric and Kristen were in fact using together within the apartment. Eric knew she had a low tolerance because of all this sobriety she just went through. He'd had friends die before, as we know. So he says, make sure she's okay. But apparently, Paul did not make sure she was okay. He went and nodded out in the U-Haw and passed out. That would be a good explanation for why a young guy in a rock band who's used to staying up late could comfortably fall asleep so early in a U-Haw. Perhaps he was using as well. This is what I think they've always covered up. I believe it's why Paul Erickson will not give an interview even when he's been offered money. He has never even once given a statement aside from the initial police report. He's got guilt. He knows what really happened. He was a crappy friend. He didn't look out for her and he just let her slowly fade away in the bathtub. He wakes up at 9.30 and she's dead. Paul went to sleep at 9 p.m. I'm sorry, but people in rock bands don't go to sleep that early. Again, I'm sure Paul could get a good night's sleep if he had a healthy dose of opiate to lull him to sleep. As we proceed into the conversation, it gets very nasty. And listen to how Courtney Love describes her friend, Nicholas Hartshorn, the Seattle coroner. Then, bizarrely, Courtney begins to talk about Nicholas Hartshorn, who had conducted Kristen's autopsy. I'm going to say one thing. Nicholas, my rock and roll medical examiner, he did say one weird thing. He goes, God, she's pretty. This is a dead person he's talking about. God, she's pretty. Yeah, so that tells you what kind of person Dr. Hartshorn is. Yes, Kristen was very pretty, but you don't say that about a naked, dead corpse. But the story's not over there. Two months later in December, Courtney has an interview with Rolling Stone music journalist David Frick. David Frick asked Courtney about Kristen's death. And Courtney says something that no one had heard before. She claims that she had to go over to the apartment to pull Eric off of Kristen's body. She claims he had a total nervous breakdown and he would not leave her alone. So someone called Courtney to come get him to pull him off. Now, I don't know how many of you have ever been near a, a death that's happened. But once the police, once the coroner gets there, you're not allowed to touch the body. You're not allowed to be near the body. But we also know that Seattle doesn't follow protocol. Just saying. Number two, who called Courtney? Was it Paul Erickson while Eric was freaking out? And did they call Courtney before they called the police? before they called an EMS. Could they have thought, well, Courtney's really good at squirming her way out of really bad situations. Let's get her over here and figure out our story and what we are going to say. I would love to have been one of the first responders because then I would know if Courtney and Eric and Paul were in there together before anyone arrived. If they were, I guarantee they concocted the story that Paul gave to the police. Now, interesting enough, at the beginning of the video, I said, within Courtney's lies, there's usually an ounce of truth. Well, we know from Janet Pfaff and Jason Pfaff that Eric ends up showing up to Kristen's funeral and he drapes himself over the casket and the funeral home security has to pull him off and escort him out. He causes this huge disrespectful scene. Could it be that Courtney was just combining stories to make herself look like the hero? Or could it be that she was the first person called and the three of them decided what they were going to say, decided what the story would be, and then later Courtney let some of the real story slip out as she is known to do. She's not a good liar, guys. I know that me and everybody, we're always like, oh, she's so manipulative and deceitful. She is, but she's not good at it. If she was good at it, there wouldn't be videos like this about her. There wouldn't be 
all this controversy in the news all the time, right? If she was good at it, she'd be an angel that everybody loved. But wait, there's even more to this David Frick interview. Kristen was his lover for a really long time. He'd already broken down bathroom door after bathroom door for her. He'd kicked in drug dealers' doors. First off, according to Kathy Hewitt, who was Kristen Pfaff's best friend at the time, the relationship did not last all that long before Kristen really didn't want anything to do with Eric and it had been quite a while since they had dated. At the time of her death, he's dating Drew Barrymore. Now, I can't blame Eric for wanting Kristen, even though he had Drew Barrymore. I would pick Kristen Pfaff over Drew Barrymore, personally, but it was over between them. And if you're trying to tell me, if Courtney Love is trying to tell me that scrawny little wimpy beta male, Courtney's bitch, Eric Erlinson, was kicking in drug dealers' doors, Come on, man. Please, come on. That dude won't even take up for himself, let alone someone else. What's the point Courtney is trying to make by saying this? She's trying to make it seem as though Kristen was a lost cause, as though she was just some total drug addict that no one could help. Everybody tried to help her. We tried to do everything we could, but she was just a lost cause. That's what that kicking in the door is all about. Trying to make you believe that Kristen is hanging around these drug dens and they have to go rescue her. Now that you've had time to hear both accounts, and if you haven't heard Janet and Paul's accounts, it's very simple, it's in the last Kristen Fat video. Now that you've heard both accounts, I want to ask you some questions just to maybe stir up some speculation and common sense can lead us to a conclusion. Number one, why did Eric tell Paul to call me in 20 minutes if she doesn't come out of the bathroom? Why would you think he would do that? Number two, Kristen was found on her knees, slumped forward, and what was described by the police as an inch or two of water. Now let's think about this. Had Kristen just fallen asleep in the bathtub and she had drained the water before she fell asleep, the tub would be empty. If she had a slow leak in her drain, you would think the tub would be empty come the next morning. It seems to me, and again, speculation, we don't know, it seems to me that she was trying to get out of the tub, she had drained the tub, when she perhaps got dizzy or became faint and then slumped down on her knees and passed out slumping forward, the inch or two of water, and this comes from personal experience, perhaps was an attempt to revive her. There was this common belief, I know when I was younger there was this common belief that if you wanted to revive somebody who had OD'd, you spray them with cold water, you shock them. Is that why there was an inch or two of water? Did Paul and Eric try to revive her with cold water with the shower hose and it didn't work? So then they freaked out and called Courtney. These are questions that we have to ask ourselves and I have others. I have my own theory, my own conclusion in which I wanted to share in this video, but I have, this is good news, I've received word from Guy Mankowski that both his agent and Kristen Pfaff's family have agreed that it is okay for him to come on my channel and talk about all this. However, they do not want it to be a topic of discussion with him, with me, until the book releases. When I have my conversation with Guy Mankowski, once the book is published and released, I will personally tell you what I have come to conclude in discussion with him. Now, he may completely disagree, and I may come to revelations myself. He may tell me things that I don't even know. I hope that's the case. I hope there are new things to learn. I'm just asking you to be patient. Trust me, I would love to do this today, tomorrow, but I have to wait just like you have to wait. In our next video, Max Wallace, the author of Love and Death, The Murder of Kurt Cobain, will be joining us for a very candid discussion, the behind the scenes of his original 90s investigation. We're going to be talking about multiple characters surrounding Kurt Cobain and Courtney Love, and one of them who tried to ingratiate himself into the story. I don't think you're going to want to miss that conversation. Max is very knowledgeable on this subject, and he has a lot of stories to share. And you don't have to wait long for that one. 
He told me that he was traveling for the holidays. He'd be back home on January 4th. And anytime after January 4th, he's willing to have that chat. So I'm thinking January 5th. But I'll probably give him a day to settle back into his house and and try to shoot for the 6th or the 7th. So it's not going to be long before we have that on the channel. Thank you so much for watching. I want your speculation. I want your comments, your questions, anything that you want to share. Put it downstairs in the comment section. Leave me a like so more people see this video. As always, we have Patreon down below. My NordVPN affiliate link is down there for those of you who are smart and want to remain anonymous while you are searching online because, quite frankly, there's a lot of people out there who will do some really weird things with your information. Keep yourself safe, guys. Be self-aware. Make your own decisions. Do not let anybody influence you to do things that you do not want to do. Until the next time, bye bye